Well, good evening and welcome to this live stream event on the 27th of July 2021. Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics here. Great to have you on the show tonight. And I have Damon on standby. He'll be with me in just a second. Just before I do bring him in, let me just go through what I always highlight, that this is not financial advice. This is just a general discussion about the things that we're both observing at the moment. Uh, also, please do play nice in the chat room. No racial slurs. We do moderate the stream. Uh, this is as of the 27th of July, 21. And if you would like to get my attention, use at Walk the World to make sure that I see your question. Um, it's just because there's so much going on in the chat. I do encourage people to share thoughts and opinions as we go through this evening. Uh, and uh, that just helps me to see through those and to see the questions. I've also enabled Super Chat, which has two effects. One is that uh, if you use Super Chat with a question, you can get to the top of the list, which is uh, one way to do that. The other is if you'd like to make a contribution to help us run the shows here. We don't do this for profit. We do it because we are very passionate about this particular set of questions and issues we have at the moment. And uh, anything that uh, people feel they can support us with really helps just to make uh, the wheels go around. And so with that introduction, um, let me just push this button and hopefully Damien will be over there. Damien, are you there? I am, Martin. Right, so why am I not seeing you? Let me just prove that. There we go. Hi, yes. Ah, good. Yeah, nice, nice to be here. It's, um, yes, it's the shoes on the other foot for a change. We're coming out of lockdown before for, uh yeah. Usually you talking to me in lockdown? <laughs> well, it is interesting. I mean, you know, what what we don't quite know what's going on. We know South Australia's coming out of lockdown. We know that Victoria's coming out of lockdown. We know that New South Wales is going in for another round of it, at least mm. a month. My own view is it's more likely to be um, uh, probably, uh, you know, into October before it all shakes out. So um, we haven't reached the peak yet. So it's not uh, looking particularly good, I'm afraid. It is looking like a long one for, um, for Sydney. And I think, though, from an investment perspective, if we want to look, sort of look forward in terms of what what to expect, I think uh, you're really pay, paying attention. What's happening in in the UK is important at the moment. So you know they've sort of declared their Freedom Day and and you know that that they're, they're, they're removing restrictions and trying to get back on with normal life. And so they've reached a, a vaccination rate. Um, you know that's that's one of the highest in the world. And so um, uh, and I think you know, even though cases have started to turn down. I think that's not the thing to watch. It's really the hospitalizations and the deaths, yep. and it's been pretty good yep. so far. And that's um, you know, a pretty good sign for the future, I think. Um, <laughs> but, but, you know, one to, one to keep, keep an eye on. And the second one is, um, you know, the US is almost basically running a, uh, a, a big experiment on, a, on, its own, um, on its own population in the way that, that, that they've got, you know, the same country with so many different states all having different, um, different vaccination rates, all having different things about lockdowns and not lockdowns and whether they believe it or don't believe it. And so, um, you know, I think you, you basically a, a, a little controlled experiment you have for um, to, to sort of see where the, where the future is. And, and to date, it's, it is to me looking as if you, you get the vaccinations there and, and you can start returning to uh, returning to normal life. Absolutely. And I owe you an apology, Damien, because I've spelt your name wrong. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> I was doing it quick and I got the, in the wrong order. I do apologise. Um, <laughs> thank you for not taking offence. <laughs> <laughs> no problems. Um, so, look, there's a lot we want to get through tonight, but I think the fundamental question is, right, the markets, of course, have reached something of a high, you know. In the US, they were hitting highs again. Um, the price-to-earnings ratios have actually come back because the results have been so strong. So on one hand, there's a hypothesis to say there's plenty more runway for the markets to continue to grow, particularly as the quantitative easing programs continue. On the other hand, there are also people saying, no, 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 this is actually now real bubble territory and it's going to actually come back at some point. Not quite sure when or how, but um, things are really stretched. Uh, and if you look below the surface, you can see some signs. And of course, the um, you know China the tech stock sector in China in particular is wobbling. That's having an impact in some sectors of the US. The quantitative easing programs are still there, but people are talking about tapering or not tapering in the Fed, etc. I think fears of inflation have pretty dissipated a bit. The bond markets have moved. A lot of moving parts. So give us your scenarios, Damien. How do you think about this when you're trying to make strategic investments decisions? I mean, it seems to me this is probably as chaotic as it's ever going to be. 
Yeah, there are a lot of moving parts at the moment. And so I think there's a, um, I'll start with the, the, the key thing that I've spoken about every time and I'll, I'll keep speaking about it every time is, is we're not in a normal market. Um, we are in a, in a situation where central banks are supporting markets and uh, governments are bailing out um, uh, you know, people, companies and, and sectors that, that perhaps should be going broke. Um, and they're, they're throwing as much money as they, they think is, is, is reasonable back into the markets. So, um, sorry, in, into the populations, and the populations are, are saving a lot of that money, and a lot of that money is ending up in, in, in markets. So, so that's our overall um, uh, key thing to keep, keep an eye on is, will there be a policy error? And, and that's the part where, um, where I'll, I'll tell you where, we're, where I'm expecting things to go and, and where there's some, some, some risks to that. But the key thing we have to keep watching at each stage is that policy error. If governments and central banks think that they're, we're out of this and they, um, they, they wind everything back and we're not out of it, that's, that's the real danger. Um, they're basically getting, getting in front of themselves. So um, it's, a, it's a bit of a nuanced view at the moment, which is, um, but I'll, I'll, I'll try and talk through the, 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 the summary of it and then maybe we can dig deeper into some of the, the, initial, the, the individual parts. Um, I think the last time I was on here, and, and probably the time before that as well, um, I was on talking about saying, um, uh, and, and I think we we're both agreeing, that we thought the inflation was transitory. And in particular, one of the things which we were highlighting was um, that it's uh, what, we're, what we've been calling an in inventory super cycle, in that you get this sudden rush of demand, um, people can't keep up, the orders all of a sudden shoot up, um, there's, there's some problems with supply chain, so that they get dragged out and the demand just gets higher and higher. We saw that um, in the lumber prices, I think we spoke about last time, as was one of the real sort of key measures of that where they went sort of three or $400 a tonne up to $1,700 a tonne and then, and then collapsed back again. And that's one of those, um, the signs that we're seeing that, that, that yes, this is an inventory cycle. So, so that's, that's one part of it. The next part, and, and probably the key part is what's happening in China, um, especially for Australia. So, China runs an economy that is incredibly reliant on um, a capital expenditure, both infrastructure and, but mainly building um, building new apartments for, for uh, people moving into cities. They're miles in front on, the, on that. They've got lots of spare stock. And so, um, and, and what's happened is as this inventory push has come through, uh, industrial production in China has skyrocketed. And so China's used the, that opportunity of, of all of their industrial sector and the manufacturing sector running really hot. They've used that opportunity to wind back on all the, the, the lending and wind back on the infrastructure and wind back on the property side. And you can see that in the, in the property sector in, in um, China has been absolutely decimated. The, what the largest stock, um, or, well, it used to be the largest stock from an equity point of view. I think it's probably still the largest stock from a debt plus equity point of view because they've just got so much debt. Um, Evergreen is is um, looking like it, it, it it's um, going to go broke. So all its market pricing says it's going to go broke. Um, I think there's they 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 have a debt pile of at least 120 130 billion that you can see. There's quite possibly other debt behind that, and their equity, which used to be bigger than their debt, has now shrunk to um, around about 10 billion in in debt. So it's like you know, one it's 10 percent of the, the size of the debt that, that and that's just the debt we can see. Let alone, we, we suspect there's probably more, um, the more sort of quasi debt sort of behind that. So, um, so, so the China situation slowing down. Um, then we have, then we go across to the U.S. and and you see within the U.S. what's happening over there is we have uh, the a bunch of stimulus checks were sent out earlier on in the year that sort of got thrown into the, the U.S. economy. There's a whole bunch of infrastructure stimulus coming. Uh, but that hasn't started yet, and, and infrastructure as well um, doesn't get off that quickly. It takes a while to sort of ramp up, and so there's this real potential that we're gonna, they've got this growth hole going to turn up, where China's rolling, you know, the growth in industrials rolling off. Um, they've already stamped out um, a lot of the excesses, or some of the excesses in the property sector. Um, they probably will slam the accelerator back on in that sector once they once they're worried about it. But they do they do want to try and normalize their economy and they know it's overbalanced so they probably don't want to do that too quickly they want to try and leave it as long as possible so um, there is this real potential you get this growth hole and if at the same time you have central banks um, you know withdrawing stimulus tapering um, and, and um, generally making a policy error that could that could end up in a, in a, in a reasonably 
big market downturn. So that's the bad side. The flip side is um, they might come even sooner. And if we've had this later run of Delta, maybe we get another um, batch of stimulus you know, around the view of, hey, look, we're almost there. We're almost vaccinated. Um, you know, we've just got this this last bit to, to, to get over. Maybe, maybe there's another wave of stimulus coming. Um, there's also the reopening side of it. So, um, you know, the US sort of, uh, depending on what, what happens in, in the UK, the US might well be reopening. Um, and you might have central banks uh, have been pretty steady on the whole the inflation is transitory and they might see that this growth and they might decide to throw even more money at the, the, the situation. So, um, and that could really end up with, with equities in, in, this, in this almost perfect position where interest rates aren't going up. So you don't have to worry about that from the valuation perspective. Um, consumers are, are saving lots of money. Um, there's not a lot of wage rises out there, but there is this sort of pent up demand starting to hit. And, and co corporates have generally got rid of a lot of um, staff during the, turn down, the downturn. And they have, there has been some real productivity gains and they won't need as much. So they, they could really earn, earn a lot more. You could see, um, you know, this is productivity gains and everything. We've already had a few earnings surprises. If you had another, you know, 10, 15% earnings surprise, um, the, the median company in the market would actually be back to, to uh, its long-term average, or its, or its 10, 20 year average in terms of the profitability. Not quite the same as the total market because um, we actually have some, some uh, stocks like Amazon's and, and um, Microsoft's and, and Facebook's and everything like that, that are actually a little bit expensive, but are, are such a large, or a little bit more expensive than the average stock and are such a large part of the market. But um, you, know, you could easily see some of those ones, you know, they might have a 20 or 25% rise in you know, earnings and they would be back to, to, to their longer term averages. So you've got two scenarios there. One disaster and you know, the market's off 20, 30%. Another one um, where markets just keep grinding higher and we just keep, keep seeing more of the same. Um, I think the, the, the danger case is a little bit less likely than the, than, the, the, than the just grind higher, but it is a real and genuine risk case that is not, um, it's not sort of a, a tail risk, you know, there's a 1% chance this might happen, keep an eye on it. This is probably, I don't know, somewhere between a 20 and 40% chance that, that you get there. Um, uh, a, a big enough that you need to be aware of it in your investing and, and taking care. The most likely path I suspect is probably that we do get a bit of a downturn. Um, markets start to panic a little bit about the whole growth part. And then um, the central banks and everyone rides to the rescue. And, you know, so maybe you get a, a 10, 10, 15% downturn and, and then you get ridden to the rescue and off you go. But, but then again, maybe, maybe they come in earlier and, um, and you don't see much of a downturn at all. Mm. And that really is the dilemma, isn't it? Um, now, there's a bunch of things I want to unpack there. But just before I do that, let me just um, shout out to Smooth Operator. Smooth is going to run up his, tri his trivia flag again in the moment. So, folks, uh, Smooth will be running a trivia quiz uh, on the channel as we go. His spelling needs a bit of work as well. <laughs> yes, exactly right. <laughs> no, yes, a, we, we need not some... Just, not just you, but... <laughs> no, we need some spelling <laughs> corrections there. Um, so I'll leave him to run with it. Um, no particular prize from, from my end tonight, but uh, just for fun, really. So uh, have a go, see what uh, see what the answer is. He always comes up with a really interesting question. So uh, you go ahead with that uh, smooth as, as we chat. What I wanted to also do was to uh, pick up one of the other comments from just a second ago from, from Jeff, who basically I think framed it like this. The question is, how long will central banks keep going, right? And to turn it around, can central banks stop what they're doing, right? And there was a very interesting report that came out from uh, the House of Lords, actually, um, literally just um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, called Quantitative Easing a Dangerous Addiction. And this report, which included uh, a number of luminaries, including uh, Mervyn King, who was the Bank of England governor back in 2008-9 when they did QE the first time, uh, as well as some very other important um, financially uh, competent people, basically concluded that in the UK, the quantitative easing program was not really anything about what they said it was about. It was doing two things. Firstly, it was to provide really cheap funding prices for the big debt the government had. And secondly, um, the quantitative easing program uh, was something that essentially was, uh, you know, very close relationship between Treasury and the Bank of England to the point where the Bank of England has lost its authority and independence. Uh, and they basically said the Bank of England has no ability to describe how it's going to get out 
all this quantitative easing, right? And so the question is, can they stop? Uh, no, I don't think they can. I think that's, um, you know, Japan sort of led the way in, in, in so many ways uh, down this path. Uh, I think that one of the key parts for me is, is it's the fiscal side. And this has been the, the I guess, the delegation of, of authority has happened over the last 10 to well, probably more like 20 or 30 years where um, you know, we didn't used to have the independent central banks. Central banks used to be part of the government and they were very, were very political. And, and that was what that was what the, the um, that was how we ran the economy. And we've had this whole idea that we'll create this independent central bank and it'll be all these, um, you know, bene benevolent um, and all seeing technocrats who will lift their interest rates up and down and we won't have to worry about it. Um, but uh, I think what's happened is is that governments have sort of successively um, tried to outsource the, the entire running of the um, economies to, to saying, well, the interest rates would run everything and, and really given up on this whole idea of um, fiscal spending to, to actually help sort of push things along. So we've started to see elements of that coming up in the US. Um, we've certainly seen a, a fair bit of it in terms of temporary support um, right around the world with the coronavirus. Uh, the question is, will we see more, more sustained and, and higher debt um, uh, fiscal policy run specifically to get us out of this problem. Because mm. I think the problem is if you sort of say, well, we're just going to run sort of balanced-ish budgets, maybe a little bit, you know, a little bit of deficit at the moment um, and a little bit of a surplus if things go well and, and whatever it is, and let's hope for that the central banks will get us out there, then uh, we're stuck where we are, where we've been for the last 10, 15 years and where Jap Japan's been for the last 20, is that, no, we, we can't get out of quantitative easing. But um, if you do get a concerted push into into fiscal, and I, I don't think we've seen real signs of that yet, um, then um, then yeah, I think they're absolutely right. And that's obviously a concern because what it basically says is that we're going to see more and more of the economy effectively owned by the central bank. You know, they're talking about owning thirty percent of uh, government bonds by the end of the September cycle, right? And they're talking yeah. about 15% of um, state bonds in Australia, right? And Japan yeah. has got even a larger proportion of the total Japanese economy inside its umbrella. It's almost yeah. like it's it's easing itself from, from the inside out, right? Um, yeah, a little bit. It doesn't, uh, well, I, I, I mean, it I, I doesn't really bother me, I guess, that, that type of debt. I sort of look at that and say, well, it's a bit like when, um, you know, my, my wife owes me some money or, or – or you know, my I, I owe my kids some money or whatever it is. If it's if it's all in the family, then it's not as if we're endangering, you know. It's 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 a shift from one pocket to another, you know, within within a within a within a family group. It's a sort of saying it's. You know, it's does it matter? Does it matter from an external party? It's basically yeah. saying you know, if, if I've all of a sudden got an extra whatever you know, ten thousand dollars of assets, and my wife's now got a ten thousand dollar debt, um, or vice versa, from an outside party, that you know, the net worth of the the class and household hasn't changed. With you know, it's one one person's assets, the other person's liability, um, and so uh, yeah. So for, so from that perspective, I guess um, I don't. It's to me the Japanese uh, scenario is really just it's it's a bit of accounting, shifting money from one pocket into the other pocket, and then saying you know yes, the, Jap the Japanese government's got all this debt, but actually the Japanese central bank has all these assets that that from you know, and if they cancelled them tomorrow, if they just said. Um, all right, overnight we're cancelling all those assets. What would the effect be? I don't, I don't think the effect would be much. Maybe markets would be scared for a little bit, but I, I really don't think there'd be a lot of um, a lot of genuine effect. I think for me, I, I tend to look at all these on a, on a net basis to to work out if how concerned I am about about the size of debt uh, government debt levels. Mm. Well, let's talk about net. And there's one interesting slide I want to show you, which is this one, which is the term funding facility on one side of the equation. So that's the money that the Reserve Bank has given the banks, 187.7 billion, right? And yep. on the other hand, how much money is going back from the banks to the central bank overnight in reverse repos at 328 billion? In other words... <laughs> <laughs> There's more money going back from the banks to the Reserve Bank than there is from the Reserve Bank to the banks, um, yeah. which sort of suggests to me they've run out of um, ideas in terms of actually creating uh, momentum. Because the idea was that term funding facility was to allow them to lend. Of course, it controlled the rate, so it's driven the interest rate down. And I actually think that TFF was more about rate control than anything else. 
But it is an interesting observation that we've actually got more money sitting in the central bank. And in the US, we've got a repo market that is um, um, actually up to nearly a trillion. That's a reverse repo. So they've got the same problem there, right? So all this money that's being created, right, isn't going to the real economy because the banks can't swallow it, right? And so what they do in Europe is they've put a penalty on the money that's going back to the central bank. <coughs> And then, of course, the central banks supporting the banks in terms of their profitability to keep the banking system alive. So we've got this really weird situation. I, I mean, I find it very hard to make any sense of it. Yeah, well, and it's interesting from the Australian perspective. And you know, Martin and I, we were talking about this earlier, but I think it's, a, it's an interesting conversation to, to sort of bring out to you, um, uh, to your listeners as well, or your viewers, um, is that the QE programs in terms of yield curve control um, within Europe in particular is really designed to make sure the banks don't go bust. You don't, want the, the, you don't want the banks going under because you want to make sure they maintain enough profitability that they actually do want to get out there and 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 make money and, and, and be able to lend money to, sorry, to, um, to people. So you've got this whole idea that if you let your yield curve become too flat um, and, and negative interest rates, then you need to be supporting that sector. So that European banks generally trade on on uh, price to earnings ratios of, of single digits. Um, and so, um, yeah, sort of whatever, nine, nine to nine times, 10 times, you know, that type of, it's just very, very low things. You look to um, Europe and Canada where, sorry, to the US and Canada where, where it's similar, um, it, but, but not as bad as that. And you sort of get PEs of sort of 10 to 12 times. And, and every now and again, you get an expensive bank that's sort of 13 or 14 times. And then you come across to the Australian market and, and we've got, you know, CBA almost trading on 20 times. And we've got these, these banks that are so much more expensive than the rest of the world. And a similar type of scenario, really, this flat yield curve and, and government, you know, the, the RBA trying to hand out money to, to get interest rates at the right level so they can, they can help give profitability to the banks. And so um, it sort of raises that question of, well, is there something so different about the Australian banks um, that, that is you know, genuinely different to the rest of the world? And... And as far as I can tell, I don't think there is. Um, maybe the difference is our regulators are more captured. And so our regulators are actually going to be um, trying to keep our banks more profitable than, than, than what they need to be so that they, they push more of this money out. But as your chart shows, you know, it doesn't really, um, you know, the banks, the banks will get out as much money as, as people are willing to borrow. Um, and, and Australia's got a record debt. So, so it's like saying, well, how much money do you want to push out? Um, and, and household savings are, are really... Uh, um, are pushing up high, and this is this whole idea of pushing on a string. And the idea is that you know you give a thousand dollars to Gina Reinhardt um, or, or you know Australia's richest, and they're just going to throw it straight on the pile. They'll put it back into the bank. And you give a thousand dollars to the poorest people, and it's out and spent. You know they're, they're going to spend it. You know they're going to spend two thousand dollars, and you know, and so um, that's the idea that you know if you you can't keep pushing on this string, and you can't keep trying to let monetary policy do the work of fiscal policy. We've reached pretty close to the end of that game. We can make things worse, but it's very hard to make things better um, using only monetary policy from, from here. Yeah, absolutely. And that's really the point, isn't it? There is a limit, right? And I, I, I have asked a few people around, around both locally and internationally is, you know, are we reaching the bounds in terms of what quantitative easing can do? They can go on creating more liquidity, right? But is it actually going to move the dial right have we got to the point where effectively it's there's too much in the system already it's already inflated financial assets it's not going to the real economy um interestingly of course in new zealand and there's some interesting comparisons between new zealand and australia right in terms of new zealand is saying well they might actually be putting rates up quite soon later maybe this year august maybe you know and they're basically saying well um we've got to try and to get house prices under control a bit now that of course in new zealand the central bank there has a responsibility to think about what its policies are relating specifically to housing, right? Whereas in Australia, nobody really cares about that. You know, it's not the Reserve Bank's issue. It's not the APRA's issue. It's not anybody's mm. issue, really. So I can say it just goes like that, right? Um, yeah. So there are some so, really interesting... And of course, fault. Yeah, it's somebody else's fault, right? And they all say, well, you know, it's it's state planning. It's, it, it's all that sort of stuff, right? And then the other mm. point is that the... Um, 
difference between New Zealand and Australia is also quite interesting as far that New Zealand is turning up the capital requirements much more strongly than in Australia. Yeah. So, so the ratios, uh, uh, you know, it's like New Zealand is saying, well, we think there's some risks in the system and we want to start addressing it. Whereas in Australia, they're saying, no, no, nothing to see here, just to keep queuing. Yeah. And the other, the other big difference, though, as well to remember with New Zealand is um, they're not New Zealand banks. The banks over there are all Australian banks that are, that's the New Zealand operation of the Australian banks. So I think from a financial stability point of view, um, New Zealand's worried about making sure that, you know, that, that, the, the houses and, and, and everything, you know, the, the rest of the economy is going to work the way um, you want it to work and you're not getting these, uh, the signals that are, that are you're ending up with, with, with outcomes, you, you, unintended consequences, what I'm trying to get to. Um, whereas in Australia, we've got the two things to maintain is we say, well, we need to keep these banks from going broke because if the mm -hmm. banks go broke, then nobody's going to get any money. Whereas in New Zealand, it's about saying, well, they're not going to... Um, a New Zealand property price crash isn't going to bring down the entire, well, we hope isn't going to bring down the, Australian, the entire Australian banking sector because it, because it, it's, it's so much bigger. Um, and so for them, it's it's about saying, well, you know, we need to make sure the economy is doing what it's meant to be doing and the banking system is doing what it's, what it's meant to be doing. Whereas in Australia, it's saying, well, we need, we've got that extra um, constraint that we need to make sure these banks don't go broke as well because then then that'll make things dramatically worse. Mm, absolutely. And... You know, it's interesting, of course, because the Australian banks are now obliged to hold assets in New Zealand, whereas previously they were able to sort of smudge it and blur it and, you know, they can't do that now. So the New Zealand um, regulators said, no, no, you actually have to hold assets in New Zealand against the obligations that you have there. Yes. For that very yeah. reason, right, because they were concerned. And in fact, um, they had a, an IMF report came out a couple of years ago looking at New Zealand and they said, do you realise, New Zealand, how risk exposed you are to the Australian economy and banking system collapsing, right? And that's why they've actually done what they've done. So they've sort of ring fenced the assets in New Zealand. They've increased the capital ratios to the point where Westpac at one stage threatened to withdraw its business from New Zealand because of the costs of the capital that was being asked to, to hold there. They haven't done it, but they were looking at it at one stage. So, you know. Yeah. Well, Interesting. So they say they were looking at it. Yes. Ah, well, you know, it yeah, was called, I think, yeah. Who Blinks First, right? Yeah. But <laughs> it, I guess it's a, it's it's that issue, uh, <laughs> not, to put too, not to push too far down this line, but, you know, it's the issue of saying, well, if you've got regulators treating banks as if they're, you know, more like maybe they should be treated um, rather than trying to bend over backwards to make sure the banks can, can get whatever they want, um, then maybe that's, you know, Maybe there's there's some sort of tension there. That's that's um, New Zealand's trying to resolve where uh, Australia's sort of perhaps leaning too far on, on letting the banks get away with um, and and making sure the banks are as profitable as they could be. Absolutely, and there's a bunch of really great questions. I hope we can get to all of them. I can't promise we will, but this is one from um, Evan, which I quite like. Are negative interest rates possible in the U.S.? Can a reserve currency do that now? you know negative interest rates can mean the relationship between the rate at the central bank in other words if if a bank puts money at the central bank they get charged that's what's happening in in euro land isn't it mm. or it can be interest rates at the retail end right yeah <clears throat> and there's a lot of difference between that um and there's a there's also this difference between uh what whether you've got a negative interest rate in terms of I bought a bond that's going to pay me back less in time, which which doesn't happen that often. Versus, um, I have a central bank which is uh, supporting, say, the banking sector by by effectively paying them to make loans. Um, uh, and so, I think um, it is possible for the for the US to see um, negative interest rates. I think they're probably the least likely though to do it. Maybe there's an element of, the, of it being the reserve currency, but I think I think the bigger element is that um, they seem to want to, or certainly the Biden administration wants to to get out and spend um, real dollars and get it into the real economy, into the the, the pockets of of people directly, rather than um, you know via the banks and, and hoping the banks will lend it out and everything will sort sort itself out. So, of, of all the countries in the world, I think they're they're the furthest down that path. Um, there will be some. Um, political issues they'll face absolutely um and and it could end up that you know that 
if they if they do particularly badly in the midterms and uh, probably get hold of could you know get hold of both houses, then maybe that's all going to stop. And and you know there might be people um, <clears throat> on on the Republican side you know willing to 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 have a recession in order to get a, a, a president more of their liking through to the the system. So you know mm-hmm. there is a there's certainly that possibility, but um, at the moment I'd say. Uh, I'd be I'd be more worried about other countries and and probably even Australia uh, with negative interest rates before I um, before getting to the US. Yeah, and of course, Lowe has said several times now it's unlikely the negative interest rates are like are, are going to come here. Although others are actually a little bit more coy about it, and they quote a couple of recent IMF uh, and BIS reports that suggest that there is actually a place for negative interest rates in the, in in the system, right? Um, yeah, absolutely. And, 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 you know, I think, I can't remember the levels, but for years, um, the Aussie Central Bank, you know, spoke about, I think, maybe being, I feel like it was 1% or maybe 75 basis points was like as low as it ever go. And, and we've got, you know, 10 basis points now. And then, and then it's changed to, oh, no, we wouldn't go below, you know, 50 basis points. And so, you know, things change. So hmm. uh, absolutely, they'll talk about, and they don't want to do it. They have, none of them want to have negative interest rates, but... Um, if if you're looking at say at a federal government that wasn't out there spending money and the economy kept falling away and and unemployment was uh, well employment was weaker than 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 what it is now, then um, the central bank can either you know push into negative interest rates and start trying different things, or they can put their hands up and say, oh sorry, didn't work, guys, you know better luck next time. So whereas <laughs> whereas you know, my my view is that's not what they're going to do. They're going to they're going to try something. They're going to try anything. Yeah. yeah. And, Negative interest rates is just one of those one of those factors that's there. And look, the fact of the matter is, the quanti- quantitative easing will continue in some form. Rates will be driven down lower rather than actually rising, in my view, particularly now with the lockdowns locally, which of course then says, well, that probably means there's more upside to house prices than you'd have thought a few months ago. And of course, NAB has actually reforecast up significant house prices over the next um, uh, couple of years which is quite interesting seeing it in the middle of all that's going on um, but that just increases the housing and affordability question and it increases the debt burden for individuals which of course is a problem in terms of it flowing through um, yeah. so, it makes so, I mean, ma- house go on yeah can I give my, house prices are a bit, they're similar to stocks in a way in that um, if if and then, except they're even more driven by by interest rates, and so if you can get in this scenario where the overall economy is is a little bit weak, um, but um, inequality is still growing, and and asset markets are doing well, so so stock markets are doing well, so um, you'll have a chunk of people who um, can't afford to get in the housing market, but well, they a lot of those people could never afford would never afford it anyway, and so but but you do have a, a bunch of people with more money who who are maybe buying second houses or or, or upgrading, and and interest rates are really low because um, central banks are yeah sorry because because the rest of the economy is weak, and we have um, uh, a government that's probably not doing a lot, but they do want to try and keep the housing market going, so they they're maybe they're handing out some more incentives, that you know you end up in this scenario where. Um, it's it's just this purgatory of, of low interest rates and not much growth, but the housing market could, could just keep grinding higher in, in that scenario. Mm, absolutely. And so, um, yeah, it's not a desired outcome, I think, but it's it's certainly a, a you know, extremely possible. And it's also quite a, it's quite a dangerous one to bet on, though, as well from a, from an investment perspective, because you're in this part about saying I'm going to bet things are going to be bad, but not so bad that the housing market crashes. And not so good that, that that interest rates go up and then the housing market will have to come off because people won't be able to afford it. So yeah, you sort of it's a it's threading the needle. Yeah, and that sweet spot is really quite narrow, isn't it? It doesn't give you very much wriggle room, you know, either on the upside or the downside. So if if we actually keep the status quo, then there is a window for prices to go higher. But if rates, as you say, start going up, prices will drop. Or if it goes the other way. Prices will drop. <laughs> yeah, and, and and yeah, and I think the the rate rise part is I don't know. I think I, I think there's we're going to see a lot more economic growth, and it's hard to see where that's going to come from at the moment. On the downside, I guess you you support there comes back to governments again, with a view of if it if if it does get really bad, then will governments step in, and will they step in fast enough? And I think the um, the you know the history um, if you had a sort of 
you know, teleported us back to 2001 or 2002, I'd say, and gave us the same scenario. So, I oh, know they wouldn't be fast enough. Government, and, you know, but the, the speed and reaction of, of central banks at, at every subsequent crisis and governments as well is getting faster and faster. Um, yeah, they could. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, yeah, it's dangerous to bet against it. It's certainly Absolutely. it's a real risk. You need to, mm. you need to do it, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't sort of go all in on a, on a bet, assuming that the next time there's a downturn, it'll be a disaster because central banks won't be fast enough to get in and, and save things. And that takes us through beautifully to the next question from Ahmed, which is, are investors supposed to invest on tried and proven fundamentals or are they supposed to invest on central banker intervention? And what does that say about capitalism? In other words, yeah. are we in a capitalist environment anymore or are we in something else? Yeah, uh, well, it's... It, it's not the capitalism that we used to have. Let's put it that way. It's not this, and 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 this whole idea of creative destruction and, and allowing companies to go broke. Um, you will, you would think, we'll have to come back at some stage. Um, but it's it is a it's a it's a capitalism where you can fail if you fail on your own. You know, you can go bankrupt if you fail on if you, if you if you stuff things up and you but and and, you, and you're on your own and, and that happens. But if you're in a reasonably big sector and the whole sector looks like it fail, it's going to fail then um there's there's bailouts and there's there's interventions and there's mm. um so so yeah so um should you still invest in fundamentals uh yes i still think there's a fund there's a there's a reason for investing in, you know, on fundamentals but i think the, those fundamentals need to um need to reflect what's going to happen with central banks and, and with governments so i think there's a um uh, you know, I'm certainly not of the view that uh, you know, profits don't matter anymore, and whatever it is, can, we're just going to go up. And I think the market movements over the past few months have been um, along that, those those lines as well. Like the really, so you know, if I'd say that we had a, a, a real sort of junk rally uh, last year, where a lot of the stocks um, that were going up were, were the stocks without any earnings and without a lot of, um, uh, you know, they're, they're all about the dream and low interest rates, and you know, yes, profits don't matter. Um, then we rolled into this year and we had this value rally where um, as, as people were worried about inflation and, and we had the, the traditional sort of cyclical stocks um, uh, push up. As that then faded back towards a you know, scenario more like we saw last year with, with uh, people expecting lower inflation, um, the junk growth really didn't perform that well um, and, 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 has, and has been trending down. Like the, the, the growth stocks that have been doing well are the ones that actually do have genuine profits and are making money and so um uh you know investing on fundamentals there's going to be times where you're going to feel like you're an idiot you're like you know there's stocks that are losing money and and just clearly um uh not worth you know what what they're valued at are, are going to shoot up in value um but eventually they will come back to a to more normal price and i think uh, you know that it, if you keep investing on those fundamentals um you will see those returns in the long term, and and, and you'll you'll have a much less lower risk um, performance as well, because there's you know you, you pick a Tesla or a, um, you know some of these um, brand new stocks with no earnings and uh, the, all the SPACs that are out there, and you know they can double and triple and quadruple in in a in a very short period of time, and then they can be back down um, you know similar levels, and it's, it's more about a um, you know running with the bulls and trying to keep it, keep it in front of the herd for that one rather than you know investing for the long term but there are a lot of people of course who are basically trading volatility right they're looking for movements and then you know trading uh, and you know if you take crypto right as we mentioned earlier on bitcoin was below um 20 you know twenty thousand. it's now you know way up right sorry thirty thousand. uh wherever it was you know wherever it was you know who knows where it is you know forty thousand. Yes. Give, give or it, take it, yeah. Yeah. But, but the point is there are people who are able to play those movements right either directly or indeed using derivatives against the bitcoin and there was a strong short sell because of the price going up all those things right but that's a fundamentally different approach isn't it to investing if i can quote unquote investing to the way that you think about the market yeah absolutely um uh, for me, it's, it's very much about trying to come back with those those core values, and and so I I basically look at all stocks as being a trade off between the quality of the stock and and the value of the stock. So um, 
you find a very high quality stock like a, a Microsoft or, or, or a Facebook or, or a Google that make you know consistent profits, very high margins, and and um, you know, relatively low volatility of their earnings. And you say, well, I, I can afford to pay extra for those stocks. I can I can pay more than average for those stocks because I'm getting such high quality earnings. And then you look at something like a um, cement manufacturer, that, which is a you know it's a fine company, um, very cyclical earnings. Um, they go from making lots of money to, to not very much money over over the courses of uh, a number of years and, and back again. And I look at those types of companies and say, well, I'm happy to buy them when they're cheap, oh, very cheap. But if they get up to sort of being average, uh, an average cost, then um, you know that that's when I want to be selling them. So, <clears throat> yeah, very much the idea is. Um, Sorry, I was distracted by that. Uh, Sorry, by yeah, your, that's, that, that's, there. that's just the <laughs> trivia. So we're not we're, we're not asking you to engage in the trivia too. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah. yeah. So that, so. Yes. So so there was a very interesting follow up from from Ray, which I'll just put up now, which is what about insolvencies, right? Because there's something in the middle of all of this, right? Yeah which is actually bubbling along. And we know we've got more zombie companies, right? A lot of them are tapping debt, very low debt. We know that a lot of small businesses are also struggling at the moment, particularly with, with the lockdowns and things. Um, and, and we know that the um, forward expectations of insol insolvencies are probably going to rise. Um, and, and I was reading something, I think it was from the European Central Bank that said, you know, the problem we've got at the moment is that the capital allocation process is not working because the capital is actually supporting all these zombie companies that should actually be allowed to fail, but they haven't been allowed to fail by central bank policy and by government policy. So mm. again, you know, how much is capitalism real at the moment versus actually keeping all the balls in the air and not allowing anything to fail? Yeah, absolutely. And this is one of those, this is the key one. Um, for me, is that if insolvencies are allowed to sort of run a more natural course, then um, then look out. Yeah, but I don't think they will be. I think the the governments have shown um, not just in this bailout, but you know basically every bailout since sort of two thousands um, that will that they're willing to support companies that, that should go should perhaps go broke. I mean, Japan did it with. With a whole bunch of their companies, just bundled them all up, and and they spent, you know, 20 years working their way out of the debt burden. Some of them are actually looking reasonable now. Um, but <laughs> finally, finally, yeah. But but it was a it was a long, slow process. Um, yeah. China did the same thing last downturn. They bundled everything to a bad bank, and and um, and off they went. Uh, you know, we had in in uh, Europe the extraordinary case of, um, you know, the the um, Irish government sort of having to bail out the Irish banks um, so that they didn't bring down the German banking system. Mm. You know, there's the idea is very much that, um, you know, that we will keep extending these insolvencies and, and keep, uh, sorry, keep preventing the insolvencies and, and just keep extending um, the, the current scenario. So um, key thing to keep an eye out for. I was of the view wrongly last year, sort of mid last year, I, I thought, um, Look, the insolvencies will come. They'll, they'll. I thought, you know, towards the end of the year, as it started to get to the stage where, or actually, I thought about, about a year after the start of the coronavirus, I thought it'd be about the time that um, governments start saying, "Well, okay, we can only support um, companies for so long." But then, the then the um, the vaccines hit, and you know, came out well, way in front of you know any expectations, and I think that provided enough cover for governments then to say, "Oh no, look, we're almost through this. No sense in letting all these companies go broke now. If we've only got another few months." And I think you know, that case will, will, will be extended for the next, I don't know, couple of years, I suppose, in terms of it being, look, the economy is still weak. We can't really allow these companies to go broke just yet. We'll keep have to get, we'll have to try and support, make sure that that doesn't all come down. And then once the economy is strong enough, then we'll let them all fall, fall over. But it's a bit like your whole quantitative easing part, where once you've started down that path, it is very, very difficult to to then say, um, or anyone with, with kids will know, you know, you set the boundaries. Um, you let a child stay up, you know, their, their bedtime is 7.30, you let them stay up to 8 o'clock one night, and now 8 o'clock is now the night, the, 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 the time they have to stay up to every night, you know. There's a, and then you let them stay at 8.15, now that's it, you know, a precedent has been set. We're, you know, I'm allowed to, that's the time I'm allowed to go to bed. And that's a, that's the way I think um, capital markets will treat this, is that, you know, no, 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 we, we're not allowed to go broke, you know, mm. under these scenarios, so... 
Yeah, I can tell you dogs exactly the same, right? If you don't set boundaries, they'll, 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 they'll they just keep pushing and pushing and pushing. It's, the, it's, just, it's just the way it goes. Um, there was this uh, comment from Xavier, which I think is actually very um, insightful. Capitalism does not allow for central banks to artificially suppress interest rates. That's the root of all these problems. They're not allowing for creative destruction, so asset bubbles are everywhere. Um, I think that's, uh, well, that's exactly right. And... and um you know, where we saw it at the start of the uh, when when the uh, coronavirus really hit is you saw that in um, private be private um, sorry in debt spreads. So the amount of extra interest you had to pay for private companies to to to, to lend to them rocketed, and that was where the federal the the U.S. Fed, which is actually specifically not allowed to 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 do to invest in in those securities came and said, well, yes, we are going to invest in, in those securities. They actually didn't have to do very much because just the, 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 the act of them saying they're going to brought those interest rates back down. But, um, you know, the, 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 the spread you can get on debt um, for taking a risk is, is very, very low at the moment, mm -hmm. and which, which is allowing companies to borrow at, at rates, um, you know, they haven't been, um, they wouldn't have otherwise been allowed to, and it keeps those zombie companies alive. But, but what is interesting, because um, I've done some consulting work for a few organisations, they still have massively high hurdle rates for projects, even though interest rates have come way down, right? They're still looking for a, you know, an internal re rate of return of 12, 15, 18, 20 percent, mm. which is interesting, right? Because that was the same sort of returns that you got when rates were at 7, 8, 9 percent. That's something not quite right there. Yeah, well, I think... Um yeah, maybe when it's when it's your money you're investing, um, you know, in terms of those types of projects, and, and people realise that you know the world's an uncertain place. If I think I can get a twelve percent return, and and things don't go as as well as what I expected, and I only get a you know I get a I get ten percent less than that, you know, I'm still positive. Uh, it's, I haven't lost money on the deal. Whereas you know if you're investing on a two percent return and and things are ten percent worse than what you you thought, then then you're making a big loss. And so yeah. company yeah. companies for projects they like to have that you know. A margin of safety on either on it in either direction. Yeah, and I know the reserve banks been banging on about that for for some time as well. Um, let's go on to another conversation point. This is from Master Singel from earlier on. What's your thoughts about investing in Taiwan semiconductor manufacturing companies, United Microelectronics Corporation, for example, due to the high demand for semiconductors and ICs? We know that there's a shortage at the moment. Is that an area that you're interested in? Have you looked at it? Have you thought about so, it? Yeah. That's, um, look. I could go on for I could spend a whole podcast on on semiconductors. Um, it's a fascinating area of the market. Um, the U.S. is changing what it's doing from a fundamental point of view from from semiconductors. Um, they had a big leadership, you know, 20, 30 years ago, uh, and they uh, they basically let other countries um, into with a view that other countries would do the the low value um, part of it. So Taiwanese semiconductor was one of them. Um, uh, there's some South Korean ones as well, but but they had this idea that they'll just do the the really basic stuff, and the U.S. companies will keep doing all the really high-end, exciting stuff. And what they found over time is that um, the people that got good at doing the the low-end stuff wanted to keep moving up, and then because they were doing they they were getting good at doing the low-end stuff, um, they were getting some more of the, uh, the 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 top workers and scientists, and and so. That meant these companies kept on growing, and and Taiwanese Semiconductor (TSMC) in particular, um, outsource is is uh, doesn't do the design and everything like that. They just they they take everyone else's designs, and they're just the best at building it, which is very different to say an Intel, which sort of designs its own and then builds its own and sort of works it from there. And so, um, but I do think there's been this step change where the US sort of allowed it to go elsewhere, and now they're trying to bring it back, and so. Um, uh, there are political risks as well with with um, Taiwanese semiconductor, um, uh, with Taiwanese companies in general. I think and, and and what's happening with China. There's political risks in terms of um, what China's doing as a as a response to this. Um, and there's um, there's certainly going to be more money thrown at the U.S. Um, sector uh, uh, and U.S. semiconductor companies by the U.S. government. Um, so. Yes, I have, a, I have a bunch of different um, companies we've invested in, and, and there's this whole range. There's actually um, some of the companies we, we own um, uh, that make the machines that make the machines, <laughs> so to speak. And so there's this, there's this whole market of about which are the ones you're buying that actually um, you know, 
and, and where the value is in the chain and, and whether you're um, I think there's certainly some of the really low value stuff was where which is the the the, the stuff that didn't get made so recently a lot of the shortages have been there but there's all these new factories being built in in the US in particular is actually um, got a number of you know really huge projects going on um, in terms of trying to bring um, more manufacturing back to the US so I guess it's a long-winded way of saying it's a really interesting sector, but I don't think it's as simple as saying the tide's coming in, every single boat in that sector is going to get lifted. Um, and it is a very cyclical sector as well, is that what tends to happen is you get like tens of billions of dollars of CapEx get thrown at the, the, the sector, and then all of a sudden everyone's losing money or going broke or whatever, and then nobody invests much for two or three years, and then all of a sudden the sector's awash and making all this money and then they go back through. It's a very, it's a very cyclical sector, and and right now there's a lot being spent on on new projects. So um, I think you've got a little bit of time in the sun, but um, yeah, don't that that sector will have another big downturn, and that's probably the time you, you want to be buying buying some more and um, or looking for the, the the real bargains within that sector. And presumably Taiwan has also a geopolitical risk, right, vis a vis China, which is also Absolutely. worth factoring into the equation. Mm, absolutely, and and they actually they're actually building some of their uh, they're building factories in the U.S. as well. So, um, but because they're yeah trying that whole onshoring and, and everything like that. But but Taiwan Semiconductor is a very good company, um, and it's taken market share from um, a bunch of other ones. Um, and so yeah, it's all about weighing up that now. You've got a high quality company, all these geopolitical risks, and and how much do you want to spend on, on actually buying that particular company, and then what other companies in the sector are, are doing interesting things as well. Mm. Okay, well, let's go on to another question. Very interesting one here from David Camp. Could you please comment on the so-called lazy portfolios, i.e. people who've set and forget their portfolios, right? And I guess there are quite a few people directly or indirectly who are in that boat. Yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> if you've got a relatively well diversified portfolio and it's very low cost um, and you're going to set and forget, um, then I think you probably do fine. I think that's that's a reasonable investment strategy. Um, I prefer to, well, and, and I've actually got some some products we're bringing out very shortly that that have got something similar to that. I prefer to lean in to some of these cycles. I think that you can reduce your risk, and, and certainly what what we've done so far with our portfolios has shown that we can reduce the risk by um, uh, when markets are high. Is it you're, you're reducing your your exposure to them, and when markets are, are looking uh, more attractive, you're, you're increasing your exposure. So you're not taking like massive wild bets, but you are sort of leaning into the cycle on, on both fronts. I think you can certainly get um, uh, a much better risk risk return um, in terms of getting a, a return that's similar or, or and, and a bit higher at a much lower risk. Um, but uh, if, you're gonna, if you've got a set and forget portfolio that's taken a few big bets uh, and isn't particularly diversified, and, and and possibly he's got some high fees. Then, um, yeah, then I think you're you're asking for trouble. You, you could get very lucky and make a fortune out of it, but I think more more than likely you'll it'll go the other way, and you'll um, yeah, and you won't. <laughs> <laughs> and an interesting question, which uh, comes up from time to time when I'm chatting with people informally, is they don't really have a good feel of what they've invested in anyway, particularly if they're in a super in, you know environment where they've got this sort of um, you know rather opaque structure where it's sort of, you know, medium risk, high risk, low risk, whatever it is. But below that, there's very little information about what precisely is in there and not a lot of information actually about performance, other than, of course, they always claim performance is excellent. Yeah, and, and a lot of unlisted, more and more unlisted assets. And and so we saw that during the uh, financial crisis is, uh, you know, all these guys with unlisted assets and, and they said, oh, well, they're, they're, worth, the, they're worth roughly what they were before. Um, you know, a... A listed airport fell by, you know, 40%, and and the unlisted guys were saying, no, we think our airport's about about worth what it was last month. Um, and so, there's issues for, I guess, fairness when you're buying in and selling out of those ones. But um, yeah, there's there's been submissions recently um, about trying to to give more um, transparency to it, and the super funds are fighting back very hard about the transparency. Um, so we. I'm sort of sitting on the other side, so I, I get to throw stones. You know, I'm in the glass house, but I do get to throw stones at this one because, you know, I show everyone who's invested with me every single stock that they invested in and, and what sectors exposures they have, and they get the full full gamut. Everything that's there, they can see with the view that, well, I'm 
not going to be their only investment. You know, it could be a central part of their investment. And then, but they want to know that if I'm investing in, in say, semiconductor stocks, um, which we are, then maybe they won't go out and buy them in their own name or won't go out as buy as, as much of them. Um, but yeah, so so there's been this push for transparency, and I saw the. Um, uh, I was just in the AFR the other day. They're talking about, uh, I think it was Australian Super commenting that they're saying, well, we've got these unlisted assets and, and we're happy to tell you that they're worth somewhere between 100 million and 300 million, but we can't give you the exact details for for, for, for you know privacy purposes and, and in case people trade against us or something. And you're like, just a minute. That's like a three times. I'm like telling you, Martin, I'm, you know, <laughs> you, your money's either worth 100K or it's worth 300K. I, I can't really tell you which one's which, you know? Yeah. For most people, that's that's bloody important. A three times difference is <laughs> is, uh, is pretty critical to the to the whole performance thing. Well, we you, you know and I know that the opaqueness in this, in the system is is horrible, right? One of the reasons why the tie up with you know what the world happened was because you guys are so transparent, horribly transparent, actually. <laughs> Uncomfortably but, transparent. I yeah, like to call it. Exactly. Yeah. Well, okay. Or, yeah, let's use that comfortably. <laughs> but but the point is, at least people know where things are and they can see what's going on. And if you compare that with the typical disclosure from some of the other funds, I mean, it's, it's chalk and cheese, so that's worth Yeah, something. well, there was a, a fund not that long ago got, had to be taken to court to work out what the, um, what the, the fossil fuel exposure was in their portfolio. Mm. So <laughs> we figured, well, we'll just tell people this is what it is. And if you want to cut it out, if you don't want fossil fuels, then tell us and we'll, we'll knock them out of your portfolio. So, yeah. And the other thing, just as we're on performance, because we could have a whole show about fun performance and how to measure it right which we won't do but we, we perhaps could do but one of the things i do observe is that the general performance of the fund does not necessarily reflect the performance of the individual investor in the fund see what i mean so right. so yes. so you can basically say well the overall fund was either up 20 percent, right but when you look at the individual holding for that individual right and take account all the other costs and the transactions and the trades and everything else right quite often the real true return to that particular investor in the fund is nowhere near close to what that top level right. number was. And particularly for small investors. So um, <laughs> it's a, uh, yeah, so what's happened is um, the super funds have decided, it's sort of the, the industry standard has become that to report performance is the performance of the fund at a gross level minus any investment fees. But they don't take away the administration fees because the administration fees quite often have this fixed component to them. So there's a fixed part and a variable part. So somebody who's got $100,000 in the fund gets a different performance to somebody who's got $200,000 or $50,000 and, and all that type of stuff. So it sounds very reasonable that, um, okay, well, let's, let's show it before the administration fees and then people can work out the rest themselves. The problem is now, because that's the way, you know, whenever these things happen, that's incentive, you push incentives that way that then people change what they're doing. So now what you've seen over the last few years is investment fees have been coming down quite dramatically at, at all these super funds, but um, the admin fees have been going up on the other side. And so your net fee is about the same, but if you get if you want to report your, your, your profitability, if you're a super fund that wants to report how well they're doing, then your numbers look better because your investment fees are lower, but your actual fees are, are roughly the same. So. And, and that means that the APRA figures that are being sort of rolled out and quoted, right, mm. are a particular lens, right? But it's yeah. not necessarily the only lens you should apply when you're thinking about what performance really was. Absolutely. And the other, and the other really important point with all these is um, if you're looking at returns, uh, especially now, you see all these um, funds that are going on. Look at, look at how well we did over 12 months. A lot of these are the highest risk funds out there. And so they fell you know, 30%, and then they rose 30% or 40% or whatever it is over, over the, and and what you, and you've, you're not seeing the, the initial fall anymore because that was that was more than a year ago. You're actually just seeing this this rise, and so um, you know it sounds great to say, oh look, you know all these funds doing um, you know 15, 20 percent per annum, but you're like, yes, but if you measure back to the, the start of the year, they've all done like three or four percent, and so um, yeah, it's important <laughs> to say it's. Yeah, you don't want, you want to make sure you haven't got that low base effect. That same thing we're talking about with inflation. Yeah, yeah base you, effects. Yeah, yeah. You fall and then it just yeah. it just looks great from the bounce off the bottom. Absolutely, yeah. So, you know, again, I think that the message is treat all of these um, performance statistics with, with a degree of caution, ask some hard questions and drill down because the actual real numbers could work, be quite quite different. Let's go on to another topic. This is one from Justin a little while ago, which was about 
is land a good investment or just good for a first home buyer um, at a high price at the moment so the interesting question about land we know that there's a lot of um, property development companies land banking in Australia in other words they bought land years ago right, and are sitting on it right and they're sitting on it watching the price go up and up and up and up and up and eventually they might actually do something with it right uh, mm. I guess the question is is that something which is um, applicable more broadly or is it really just uh, for the, um, the specialist land bankers oh yeah um, look there's lots of things going on with that um, probably the biggest uh, thing I'd say is the biggest thing, if, you, if, if that's your plan, is to look out for um, the, the new stamp duty. Or well, sorry, it's not a stamp duty, is it? Uh, the, the value uplift taxes they're putting on. So they're basically saying if you're if you're basically buying on the outskirts in say a rural property, and then you're betting that that's going to get class, reclassified to urban, and all of a sudden you can build much more houses on it. That value uplift used to be like be a free kick for everyone. Um, you just you know, you. You bought a rural property that was worth whatever five hundred thousand, and then you know next day at the sign of a pan it gets reclassified to urban, um, or or you're you're buying property that you know you can build houses on, and all of a sudden you can build apartments on, and and it goes from being worth five hundred thousand to being worth five million overnight. Is that now that that uplift from the five hundred thousand to five million is going to be taxed? So there's less of, in, in a lot of well, it's uh, in some in Victoria it's happened in. Um, uh, New South Wales, uh, they're certainly looking at it. I think uh, they confirmed that, Martin, that, that they're going ahead with it in New South Wales. Uh, it's certainly um, still in the works, but that they are yeah. offering the option, and they're going to roll it out more broadly. I think, yeah. Yeah, and then so so, and it sounds like an idea of, of something could easily get take on and 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 sort of end up in a lot of places. So that that sort of reduces some of the risk, you, some of some of the upside you might have seen in in the past. Um, and the other interesting one for land, for us, for me, is uh, solar power is coming down at this dramatic rate, and um, and batteries are as well. And one of the big problems um, with rural properties, a lot, or especially a lot of rural ones, where you know in, in, in sort of more out, um, uh, more remote areas, is getting is getting electricity and, and other services put on can be very very expensive, um, but. Solar panels, solar panels, and, and batteries are actually starting to reduce that cost significantly, and so maybe that means, um, you know, it does open up a bit, a bit more supply. So that's that's your main risk is you're basically betting on will Australia keep trying to constrain the land, um, or will they actually open up and and um, and sort of let more supply in at some stage? So, um, uh, and and land obviously you have holding costs. You know, there's a holding cost you have that you uh, with without anything to offset it. So. Um, yeah, it's it's a. I, I much prefer to see investments where you can say, well, even if I hold on to it, um, you know, if you buy a house that's expensive but you can rent it out, and you're like, well, even if I hold on to it, at least I've got this cash flow coming in, and that'll that'll help sort of defray the the costs. Whereas land, that's just not the case. Mm, absolutely, and it is interesting because, um, you know, if you talk to um, some people in the real estate sector, they'll say. The land is actually where the value is. You know, you might have a house on it, but you could easily knock the house down and put something else on it, or whatever. But it, it is the land, and it's the land that ultimately um, seems to be quite sticky. And then, of course, you've got this debate between those who say, "Well, we don't have enough supply of land, and therefore supply is the problem. And if you release more land, that would solve the housing problem, right?" And they've got the other people. I'm in the other camp that says, "No, no, no. It's not about really the price of the land. It's about the availability of credit. Because the more that credit is available, the more that it pumps up prices, and it pumps up the price of everything, including land." So it's very interesting to, to debate. Yeah. And, and, and if you, and I'll add, I'll add one more dimension to that as well. Hmm. Is is it's this affordability part? And I'll, I'll plug our own. Uh, uh, property calculator as well, where we look at this affordability and the rent, you know, how much it costs to rent. And, and I think there's a level where, you know, if, if I said to you, Martin, um, you know, I, would you like a nice beach house for, um, you know, for $10,000? You'd go, oh, well, yeah, maybe, I, maybe we'll have a beach house if it's only $10,000 and you can live in your, your current house and maybe you could have a house down at the ski slopes for the same price as well. You're like, and, and so people do have a desire to have more than one property and, and, and form bigger. And, and, and so, there's a, there's a certain element of saying um, if prices, yeah, as you said, the prices are it's a relationship to credit and, and it's the household formation um, part about saying if prices are too low and, and people are making all this money and don't have any disincentive to buy more than one house, then um, history shows that's what they'll do. 
Um, and then there's such a large amount of people um, that can, you know, get an extra flatmate or, or um, you know, stay, stay living with their parents for a little bit longer. That household formation is, can really drive that um, demand up or down um, quite significantly. And so, yeah, that, that whole affordability measure, which all comes back to those interest rates in the end, is, is pretty key. Yeah. And then the other question is, you know, migration directly or indirectly, right? Because migration is the, the other lever, right? And, and, and you know, if, if you think about the, there are two things that actually create the contention. One is low interest rates, big loans, loose lending standards, right? And then more people demanding property and therefore coming in particularly from overseas and, and, and buying. So if you have very strong migration, then the population growth is quite strong, whereas at the moment the population growth is pretty weak. Mm. And we also know we've got, what, 1.2 million spare properties across Australia. So, you know, the old supply, I call it the supply lie, right? There's, there isn't really an undersupply of property. It's just the, um, and there's an undersupply maybe of affordable property, but mm. the real estate sector and the construction sector continue to spruit the continued construction because that's what they do. Yeah. Oh, look, I've got... And, uh, that's right. I have I have more sympathy for the construction sector than I do for the selling because at least you go well. Okay, you're out building new properties and 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 and, and hopefully contributing, you know, to to it versus um, versus just selling. You know, versus the two of us, Martin, you know, buying and selling houses between each other and bidding the price up every time. And you know, I bought it for five hundred thousand, and then you buy mine back. You buy it back for six hundred, then I buy it back from you for seven hundred. We just keep bidding the price up. And we're like, it's still the same house. Nothing's happened to it. At least with the construction side, you're like, well, we built some new, some new amenities, and it means we can, you know, people can have bigger houses, or we can have more households, or people can be happier, hopefully. But um, yeah. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, and with all of these things, you know, it's never one thing, right? There's always a, it's, it's a multifactorial, right? And that's why you find that, um, you know, regulators and um, central banks and other people just say, no, it's not negative. It's somebody else's problem, right? <laughs> I just, I just, I think there's a, you know, there's an interesting um, debate at the moment is, do we need a royal commission on housing, right? Would that be helpful, right? And and there are some cynics around to say, well, Royal Commission on Banking didn't actually serve us that well. So why would uh, a Royal Commission on Housing do anything more, bearing in mind, of course, the fact that there is so much. But the federal government has announced an inquiry, a political inquiry, into the supply side of housing, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's sort of a, a, a small carved out piece of the puzzle, as though that's the piece that's going to solve the problem. And I, and I think, no, no, no. If you're going to do it, you've got to have some joined up thinking here and actually understand how holistically it all hangs together. Uh, and there was a report done quite recently um, called Housing Taming the Elephant in the, in the Economy, right? Arguing that actually, if you look at it holistically with all the construction, all the finance and everything else, what's happening with the, um, uh, the housing sector is really trampling the rest of the economy. It's sucking the air out and basically they argued for a holistic requirement to think about this so they actually said well, we need a, a royal commission i'm not sure whether it would actually get much heat i may get heat probably but much light out at the end of it yeah i don't know it's like a, a good therapeutic scream into your pillow martin you know is that, <laughs> that doesn't help anything but it sort of maybe makes you feel better for a little bit you know? it hasn't solved well, the, the, whatever problem it was it was uh, so. uh, and that's the point i made on twitter today you know if there had been an intent to solve this it could have been solved years ago right there is no political intent to solve no, this sure. that's the yeah. point because yeah. it's the election cycle the political cycle it's the wealth effect it's the winning the next election stuff which is much more important than actually fundamentally solving housing affordability or anything else like that right that's the problem we've actually got so there's a mixed yeah. a mixed message and mixed agenda going on yeah and i think i mean it's it's, it's hard to say because obviously government built housing is um tends to be the worst how it tends to certainly look the worst housing you know 20 years later but it does seem as if there's a there's there's you know there's a there's a decent correlation between um when economies that used to in the 60s and 70s have a quite a quite a large sort of government funded building of houses and particularly lower the lower value types of houses because if you're a developer you don't want to build those houses because you don't get as good a profit margin in it mm. um and um and, and affordability and so yeah, I think there's. Um, I mean, look, it's a good thing to have a royal commission. I mean, I don't, I don't want to. You know, it's 
it, it would be good to look more into, into the housing and, and a holistic picture. But but even looking at any component of it, it would be good. Let's just hope though that that um, yeah, the Royal Banking Commission came out with a list of recommendations that on day one we were going to put them all in, and and on day by day sixty it was like well maybe we won't put any of them in, you know. Yes. And That's so, and maybe the maybe the, first, the the very first one will actually go the opposite, completely the opposite direction to what they said. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, and then, sorry, just I'll put that in context for people who who are probably aren't as close. The very first one was we've already got the laws. We don't, you know, we've already got these responsible lending laws. We don't need to change them. Mm. And um, now we're trying to change them. We're trying to make them easier. Mm. And so, um, yeah. So, uh, and, and that was the definitive recommendation from the Royal Commission: keep those responsible lending laws, right? And yet yes. they were the ones that were trying to be removed. They've sort of got stuck in Parliament at the moment, so they might—they're still with us at the moment. And it's interesting that if you go back to the um, financial service inquiry um, that David Murray actually um, for, uh, oversaw, he made a very important recommendation that he 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 regarded the need for a super if you like, super regulation. In other words, a regulator looking down as to what the RBA, APRA and ASIC were actually doing, right, to make them accountable, right? And guess what? That was the one that was thrown out immediately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, I think as well, I mean, I might, a big picture sort of look at um, what's happened is we've had these, these, and certainly I'm looking for my industry in terms of um, financial planning and, and um, uh, you know, the issues that you had in terms of that vertical integration is that... Um, there was a bunch of rules put in uh, sort of 10 years ago and they were, I think they were largely skirted around was I think, and that's the main problem that, um, you know, the people who ran into trouble like AMP and, um, and IWF and, and a few others was that they're like, well, whatever you're doing is, is designed to sort of, so that you don't have to do what the rules told you you're meant to do. And then that was sort of the real push behind, the, the, which is why I said, you know, a lot of these responsible lending laws and other things was like, it was, it was a lot of it was about saying, you just need to apply the rules you have at the moment and not let people cheat them. <laughs> and um, yeah, and so I think that's where um, I think in, in the housing side, you know, it would be good to shine a light on those parts to actually come back to things that we know what the, we know what the, most of the answers are um, and they've come out, you know, there's things, whether it be, you know, broad-based land taxes and, so you actually create a cost for, um, make it easier for people to move. And you, you don't sort of tell people that, you know, if you want to change jobs between one side of Sydney to the other, you're going to have to spend, you know, 10 years worth of savings to do it in order to move and pay these stamp duties, you know, if, and, and you try and make it incentivize people, you know, a um, say a, a somebody who's, at, you know, husband's passed on and, and all their kids are, have moved out, you want to encourage them from moving out of a five-bedroom house in the suburbs into something smaller, um, whereas the current system discourages it. And so there's there's all these things that would, would I'm assuming in a Royal Commission would actually show up and, and point them out, but we know they're all there and, and they've been they've come out in, in any number of different surveys, but it'd be nice to remind it again of them and, and maybe one or two of them might get picked up on and hopefully we'll chip away and eventually, I don't know, Maybe I'm maybe being too optimistic now. Maybe we'll eventually end up with a working system, but now I'm just talking crazy. <laughs> well, you know, I, good to be optimistic. That's, 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 what, right. that's what I think. Um, here's one from Evan, which I think is quite interesting. How do you think the government will approach wage growth with a drop in immigration starting to push up wages? I heard the recent labour shortage is starting to blow up the RBA models. It's a very yes. interesting question, right, about um, wages growth, because the Reserve Bank is saying, well, oh, there'll be some wages growth, but it'll be very slow over the next two or three years. And yeah. then Philip Lowe said, and in fact, if you, um, if you allow immigration to start again, that's going to put more downward pressure on wages. Yeah, so these are the old wages, that, uh, wage growth models that they kept getting wrong, or the new yes. ones that they've well, built since then? Uh, good, good question. <laughs> Do they, uh, have they got some new ones now? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm hoping so. I think, uh, look, I think to, to their credit, is you know there's not too many people who would have put out that that chart saying, hey look we've been forecasting prop wage growth uh, wrong for like ten years, <laughs> yeah. and and there's a there's a famous chart out there for anyone who who hasn't seen it that's sort of basically showing that every year um, the RBA was forecasting wages would co would go back to trend and every year they did, and and now they've sort of come out and said look we think a lot of that well, well they've come out at least acknowledging that's a problem. And they said we actually need to see this wage growth and, and get it back. And and recently they've come out saying that okay, maybe all that that um, uh, immigration that we've been running, maybe that 
was actually causing these, was helping to cause some of the low wage growth. Um, so I think absolutely the, uh, that is, that, that immigration does uh, contribute to low wage growth. I think mm. there's a bunch of different um, uh, skilled wages uh, sectors that, that just aren't skilled wages sectors. Uh, I think there's, uh, if you look at the sort of, um, in theory, if, if you're trying to bring in, if you've got genuine skills shortages, then, um, and you're bringing in these skilled migrants to, to fill those, then theoretically the, the wages of those migrants should actually be higher than the, the people working in your economy because, mm. you know, we haven't got people to do this job. We need to bring in specialists from overseas to do it. You know, wouldn't you think you'd actually need to pay these people more to bring them in? But that's not the case. It's actually the opposite. And so, yeah, I think there's very a very strong case to show that. Um, um, so that's a, so so will so, so, so to show that immigration is is, called, is is at the heart of some of the low wage problems. Um, having said that, though, it's, I don't think it's the whole story. I think there's there are also deflationary issues. I think um, there's uh, been a huge loss of, of bargaining power from um, from employees. Uh, just the, the 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 rate of unionisation's gone down. Um, now with uh, work from home being um, significantly more than what it was um, two years ago, uh, a lot of Australia's or a lot of developed countries around the world have opened themselves up now to competition for job roles from um, uh, emerging markets that, that can pay much lower salaries. So um, I do think there's a lot of other things. There's a lot of other factors. I'm... I'm relatively hopeful we'll see a bit of wage growth. Um, I don't think it'll get out of control. Um, and, I, and I do think there are um, some quite significant pressures that could come back down to bear, especially if we did reopen the, the immigration, that mm. could see wage growth, that, that all, any sort of um, positive movement on the wage growth sort of wiped out. So, so I'm hopeful, but um, I'm certainly not expecting wage growth to get out of control. And I'm worried that um, we'll go back to what we used to do and, and that'll see wage growth shrink. <laughs> Yes. Well, there's certainly a lot of people in Australia in my surveys who have seen no wages growth for a long, long time. Cost of living going up, wages growth flat, hours going down rather than up. That's why we've got a bit of a crunch at the moment in terms of and, many households. Yeah. And the other thing to remember as well is we've had a little fair bit of structural change as well. So, yeah. um, you know, the um, if you, manufacturing that's, that's suddenly taken off or, or more home building and, and they need to get more people to come and work there and they need to convince um, – you know, whatever it is, a, a, somebody who is a laid-off airline host or hostess to come and pick up a, you know, pick up some tools and help with the building, or, or sit and or come work for a, for a construction company and sit behind a desk or whatever it is. So there's a certain element of you need to offer some higher wages to to entice the people to to stop waiting for their old job to come back and, and come come work in a new sector. Um, but that's um, by its very nature, you know, relatively transitory, and and it could flip back the other direction as well once once the reopening happens is that you know you, you'll, you'll go back to you know more people working in entertainment and 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 fewer people working in some of these other some of the other newer sectors <laughs> absolutely right yeah well i think there's a lot a lot to play in there and uh, you can overlay education you can uh, um overlay skills and investment in skills all of those things which are another area which uh, i i'm get frustrated about because we're not focusing enough on building the labor force we need for the next generation frankly it's you know that's the real well yeah, yeah. For me. and that's yeah exactly and and that's for me as well yeah from, so from a from an investment perspective you look at these and go that's great if you can bring in lots of people um you keep your costs down and your companies get all the profits so yeah from, from an investment perspective uh, it works out that way from a social engineering perspective though i'd much prefer to see that more wages are being earned and and and, and you'll get more um you get a, a more sustainable long-term growth if you if you actually got you know wage growth and um, growing, um, and the, the the benefits being shared more equally, you, you know that, that'll that'll lead to sustainable growth. And it would be great to be able to see companies rather than say um, we've got a skills shortage. You know we need to bring people in for overseas and say we've got a skills shortage. Why don't we train a few Australians to um, to do this role? Yeah, but you see that's really. Th the big question isn't it which is what is society for right because it seems to me it should be more than just turning a dollar you know and making shareholders richer right there's a bunch of other absolutely. important values that should be as part of the story too yeah absolutely and so um 
and I don't want to. I, I guess I, I don't want to try and tell people that you know. They, let's say within our fund is a, is a good way of how uh, examples how how we'll invest on, on this basis is we will look upon these things and say, okay, this is not a good trend for society, but it's not looking like changing, and so we're not we're gonna we're gonna invest in the companies that will benefit from that. Um, we have some ethical screens you can put on over the top with a view that some people don't want to invest in those companies, and they can sort of they can. Um, they can just wipe those out, and so they, they don't. We just reduce the, the, the stocks. So rather than getting a, a 95 stock portfolio, you might only get a 90 stock portfolio because you don't want any tobacco stocks and gaming stocks in your portfolio or things like that. And so, um, yeah, I, I think from an investing point of view, very much, you know, people should be aware that, um, or at least keep in mind that, that, that you have options to say you don't have to invest in, in, in stuff you don't like. And so, and, and life is more, more than just about money. So, um, but it's a grey area. Everyone's got a different view, and so um, we try and invest based on what we think will, will make money. But we're we're certainly happy enough to call out that behaviour when we see it, and um, and also give investors the option to to wipe those stocks out of their um, portfolio so that they don't benefit from. <laughs> All right, we're running uh, up against our deadline, but there were two questions which we just wanted to touch on. I had quite a few people ask about precious metals, you know, and particularly gold, silver. Um, What's your view of those? And it comes back to a fundamental question for me is where is the value anchor point, right? Is the value anchor point the dollar? Is it gold? Is it the US dollar or is it crypto? That seems yeah. to me to be the really interesting question. It's a, it's a gold's a currency. Uh, if, sorry, it, it's <laughs> gold's lots of things, but but I think the most the most important thing is to treat it as a currency yeah. um, in terms of investment sense. And so, um, if everyone's trying to devalue their currencies, then there's some benefit in, in gold, and everyone is trying to benefit, trying to devalue their, their currencies. Hmm. But then there, there are some other issues in terms of, um, uh, well, a little bit in terms of supply, um, but but mainly on, on that front is that basically if central banks decide or, or investors decided to to sell, then that would wipe out the entire market. So you are it's 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 to a certain extent, well to a, to a large extent, it's basically um, you're, it's the can I do something before other investors do it, and so yeah, so you need to be aware of what's happening within that market and what you know what what are the trends and and are, are you what, are you facing these issues with inflation or or not? And at the moment, we're not really inf issuing facing those issues with inflation. Um, we have central banks trying to get out there and, and print money and and devalue currencies, but but it's really not working that well, and so. Um, you know, the, when the days when we wake up and, and everyone is worried again that the inflation is about to take off, there's there's certainly some value in um, in looking at those and, and looking at. You know, uh, but but I, I would treat them as a small part of a portfolio, rather than as a needing to be like a major part of uh, of what you have. Mm, and this is interesting because you know I speak to some people who have a lot of their wealth tied up in metals as though that's the only thing that's got value. It's the only value hook they can see, right? So whatever else is going on out there, at least I know I've got my gold. And then I say, well, just look at the price of gold, right? It's dropped below 1800 again now, US, right? Um, mm. Hasn't done a huge amount over, over recent times. May later, but, um, yeah. you know, well, what is its purpose? Yeah, well... Um I mean, there's, industri there's some fantastic industrial purposes. If, if it was priced that's sort of more similar to um, just to sort of copper or something like that, you know, mm -hmm. there'd be there'd be thousands of extremely valuable uses you could put gold to. But um, yeah, it is a it's it's, it's worth what the next person's willing to pay for it. Really, is is um, the industrial use of it is so small relative to investors and central banks. So yeah, um, yeah it's a. It's a great, a greater full investment, as they call it. I just need somebody else to buy it for me at a, at a higher price, which Absolutely. is you know, very similar to, which is why when people call you know digital, uh, sorry, bitcoins and everything like that, the digital gold, there's, mm. there's a certain truth to that. You know, I just need somebody else to pay this, pay more for, for this, and that goes to trading yep. cards or Beanie Babies yep. or whatever it is that you, you think someone is going to pay more for, um, yep. but it's but that's different to investing. And interestingly, both gold and silver and cryptos have a whole derivatives framework around them, right? And so one of the things that I keep coming back to and I keep highlighting to people is you can't think of these as pure markets, 
right? Because there are people basically taking positions, using derivatives to be able to actually influence what's happening beyond your ken in terms of looking at the price at any point in time. Yeah, yeah. So some of that for gold is is producers who are trying to hedge their production. They, they want to make sure, you know, if, if it's costing them $1,500 an ounce and um, to, to produce it and the, the prices are 1800 and they're like, well, I want to make sure I, I, I make... I'll at least could pay the bills if everything if it all turns. Uh, there's a bit of hedging within that, but but then as you said, a lot of it's just speculation, which is um, yeah, others sort of trying to push things in in different directions. <laughs> and getting on and the get Twitter leverage. and getting on the um, on the Reddit and trying to persuade people to buy or sell or, or whatever. But don't get me started on that. <laughs> but that's but that's exactly the greater fool thing. If I can get onto a platform and find more fools, then I yep. found my greater fools. So correct. Yeah. Welcome to the realities of the market. OK, last question. Well, probably last question for tonight. Um, and I know that you're not going to take a political stance on this, but Labor has now retreated on capital gains tax and negative gearing changes. Right. So basically, there's no light now between the two parties on, on that very important policy platform. Um, no surprise from me. I expected it to happen because I didn't think they were going to try and stand up as a big target. But what that basically says is that both sides of politics have the same lens through which they look at property and capital gains, which is an interesting observation for Australia, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. So w w can you tell me what the Labor politician, what Labor differences are to the, to the Liberal Party? What, what well, are the major that, policy I, places? I, I, I don't know. Not on those two, because basically they said, well, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll let the uh, capital gains taxes and negative gearing changes stay rather than... And and we're going to push through the the high the the wage cuts to yeah. sorry the tax cuts the for tax high cuts, wage earners. Correct, exactly right. So they're basically following following Scomo's um, policy settings, right, on those particular things. So there's no light between the two. So no. small target, right? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, it's the same target in a way. It's just basically <laughs> we're, we're we're the same as those guys, except we promise not to rape as many people, or I don't know, or or cover up as many. I don't know. I th look, I, don't, I, I guess what I'm saying is I don't think there's a lot of choice between either party at the moment. No, I think there's, that, that's but, my but, point. That's my but, exact point. Yeah. But 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 from an investment point of view, um, okay. okay so, so let's let's not get political. Because, yeah, mm. there's people agree with some and, and, and the others. Well, I won't go there. Yeah. From an investment point of view, it actually means there's a fair bit of certainty around at the moment. Yes. Um, there's there's neither on the looking for something different. Um, there's chances are if, if somebody does come up with a policy and. Um, uh, the other one will probably come up with something very, very similar to it. Uh, so, yeah, from an investment point of view, um, there doesn't look to be a lot of change, um, which is which is good because there's a lot of other there's so much other change going on elsewhere. Um, but um, from a um, from a bigger picture sort of society point of view is and, and sorry, the other thing that's good is companies have been one of the big winners from this whole process. So co corporate profitability is great at the moment. And, mm. and we've got this reporting season going on in the US and it's still going great. It's, it's yeah, upgrades all around. So um, whether that's a great outcome for society, again, I'll, I'll leave that to the, to the side. But as an investor, when you go, well, both sides are committed to letting companies be as profitable as they can and trying to funnel as much towards them as they can, then um, it's, it's hard to take the other side of that bet purely for a, from a moral perspective of, um, yeah. So... I think maybe vote vote for people who might help deliver that outcome, but but at the moment it's invested like um, this is this is the the world we live yeah. in, and yep. um, and until we see um, significant change, um, yeah, this is where we are. Very last question for tonight from from Cookie. Tomorrow's inflation number will be Shane is saying Shane Oliver is saying three percent, uh, highest three point nine percent. It's going to be quite uh, strong, isn't it? Yeah, it will. Um, Look, it's going to be strong. It's going to be above the the, the RBA's band. Um, the the tough thing is, Australia reports it's 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 inflation so infrequently <laughs> that um, you sort of you sort of lose track. I sort of in a way I lose track because I'm looking at so many other countries and what's happening with inflation and trying to work out. Um, so they're all they're mainly looking like they're peaking and starting to come back. So um, I'm I'm not going to have a look. Uh, I, I don't I don't take a guess at it. Um, I think it will be. 
to be honest, I'm, I'm probably less concerned as well about what's happening with Australian inflation because um, we are so open to the rest of the world. I'm more concerned about what's happened to world inflation. Yeah. And, and that does seem to be peaking and coming back. Um, and the problem with Australian inflation is you know, here we are almost at the end of July. We're about to tell us what was inflation for the three-month period in which we know it was really strong in March and April and then starting to taper off by the time we – oh, sorry, April and May and starting to taper off by the time we got to June. But we're not going to find out for another three months what's actually going on right now. And so, um, yeah, so uh, I think the – unfortunately, the Australian inflation rate is – is um, is relatively useless from an investment perspective. <laughs> it's pretty meaningless, isn't it? Although, of course, it'll be all over the headlines and there'll be massive amounts of mainstream media coverage. But yep. and it's there'll be people signifying saying, hey, not a lot. Yep, and there'll be people saying, hey, we have to raise rates, you know, yep. look at inflation. It's exactly this is what we saw in the US. Yep. So, so yep. The, the thing to keep in mind is, um, and, and this is a, we spoke about this definitely last month and, and I'm sure the month before as well, is that <laughs> um, there's a lot of people out there who've been saying inflation is coming for 10 years or more. Since the financial crisis, they were like, all this government money printing is going to cause runaway inflation. Um, it's going to be it's going to be terrible. There's going to be hyperinflation. It's the end of the world as you know it. And um, they've had 10 years of not not actually being able to have, not actually having that come through. Um, tomorrow is going to be one of the few times where they'll be able to stand and say, look, inflation's here. You know, it's a time to be, you know, you got to, you got to pull your head in. You've got to stop spending all this money. You've got to do all these other things, you know. And so, um, and as I said, that the, the uh, they're going to get their moment in the sunshine. And so, maybe markets will react to it. I think um, I expect they won't because um, I think they're they're more focused on looking at other countries where you, you get a much more um, uh, an ongoing read in inflation. So, looking very much to say China struggling with with inflation is is as low. Um, uh, US has is, is, is got some very high inflation, but um, when you look at the components, it does very much seem to be in the transitory elements of it. So, yeah, mm. I think that's, yeah. that's, that's yeah. the key place to watch. And that'll be the debate, won't it? You know, transitory or not. Um, the risk of policy misstep, of course, if, if, if it's a really big number and there's a lot of pressure from the markets and elsewhere for rates to move up, they might move them up perhaps too soon. On the other hand, we know that CPI is not necessarily a very good reflection of real experiences of real people. So there's a bunch of, you know, complexes. Yeah. Well, and, and the other thing is Sydney and Melbourne have gone into lockdown since then. Well, Melbourne's hopefully out as of another two and a half hours. Mm. Um, but, uh, you know, that's they're not going to – I find it highly unlikely that on a, on a backward-looking, you know, measure um, – like that, that the RBA would really be doing anything. They'd, I, don't, I don't think they would. They'd, they'd look at the number of things that have changed and almost just go, well, it's it's meaningless. Uh, it's meaningless as a number, regardless of how high or low it comes in. <laughs> what we really need to be looking at is is what's going to be the effect of these city lockdowns and 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 you know changes in demand and, and other things like yep. that that are going on right now. So I've got this here. They've got these series of at rands inside the Excel spreadsheet, right? They push the button and out comes a number. <laughs> it's yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. It could be uh, <laughs> no no better, no worse. Look, we've run out of time. I've got loads of questions we didn't get to, but uh, Damon, I want to say thank you very much for for your time tonight. Just to say, uh, as I always do, um, if you want to find more about the What the World Funds and Nuclear's Wealth, go to whattheworld.com.au. There's a whole lot of information there. Um, yep. You know, I think this association works really well in terms of actually yep. sharing some thoughts. So, And register your email address. We'll send you out, you know, information, not not only just, not a, it might be a little bit of sales stuff, but, but research information as well. We'll send you out, you know, the latest, um, what our thoughts are on, on these. And so you get to keep up to date with them. Um, with what's going on and how yeah. our thinking's evolving. Terrific. And uh, hopefully we'll do it again at the end of next month. Um, seems to be a good time of the, uh, you know, the, the, the sequence to do it, which I think is around the 30th. So if you're up for that then, that will be, uh, that will be terrific. And, Sounds um, good. Hoping you guys will be, uh, so is that after your lockdown? We'll no, I, th I suspect we'll still be <laughs> locked down, unfortunately. You know, I think this is going to be um, a long, slow grind because we still haven't hit the peak yet, unfortunately. So, anyway. I mean, no, But enjoy your freedoms, you know. I guess it's timely because you've had more time locked down than we have so far. But, um, yeah. I yeah, that's probably... right. You've got, you've got a while to go before you, um, <laughs> before you catch up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, best, best of luck for everyone out there who is in lockdown mm. and, and for those who, who aren't, you know, get yourself vaccinated and uh, 
let's uh, hopefully we come out the other side of this. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much for your, your, your time tonight. Really appreciate it. I'm going to take you offline now and I'll just close out the show. So hopefully that worked. Yes, it did. Good. And uh, just to let you know that uh, next week you will have the pleasure of myself and I'll be entertaining you talking about the household stress and scenario updates. A lot of information, a lot of new data because, of course, what's happening with all the lockdowns. So it'll be uh, worth joining me for that at 8 p.m. Uh, the um, next Tuesday. So look out for that. Damien, thank you very much for your time tonight. Really enjoyed having you on. Thanks very much for watching and uh, take care, everybody. And uh, we will we'll see you next time. This is Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics signing off. Good night. <laughs>